Welcome back to BTR Boxing Podcast Network. I'm your host, Sean, and I'm joined for Shooting the Breeze with Luke, all the way from America. Luke, you're coming on to Shoot the Breeze, and I love Shooting the Breeze with you. I love Shooting the Breeze with Johnston, but I certainly love Shooting the Breeze with you because you've always got a different perspective than what Johnston has, and, and you bring a different element to the conversations about your own personal experiences and, and what you do on a on a sort of general basis within boxing. So it's always great to get your opinion on things that are going on in the world of boxing. And when I said come on the show and do another Shoot the Breeze episode, just before we jumped on the show, I noticed you put a tweet out and it was about pay-per-views and how fed up you are getting with pay-per-views in general. So I thought that might be a really good place to start this conversation off really is just pay the pay-per-view conversation happens more often than not doesn't it with everybody I, I just suppose like where where are you at with it now like mentally where are you at with pay-per-views I mean what what can be done to change this how fed up are you with it all well I think that my big issue is pay-per-view should not be the standard pay-per-view should be something when there's a ton of excitement fights go on pay-per-view Andy Ruiz, like Luis Ortiz should not be one of the fighters that was on pay-per-view the most in 2022. Yet he had two pay-per-views that he was in headlining bouts. Doesn't that sum up the issue with pay-per-view? I get that we're coming off a financial crisis in 2020 and people are trying to make money back. But when average to above average good fights are now deemed pay-per-view fights, how many people are just going to check out of boxing? Because it's like there's fights that I'm not watching anymore and I'm just watching highlight videos and I can put box. I just don't want to allocate the money to this when I'm paying $70 for a cable subscription, multiple dollars for streaming services. And these fights aren't giving this the level of entertainment these other services offer for that same exact money. It's a massive problem, I think, at the moment. I think people always say it's been a problem in general with the whole pay per view setup. And, and, like in the UK, for example, I remember growing up in the 90s where a pay per view is exactly what you said it was there. You said it straight up, which was a pay per view should be when uh, a headline marquee fighter is fighting in a highly competitive fight against somebody that is not going to bowl over within two rounds and that there's excitement around it because there is legit competitiveness going on in that ring and or is expected to go in in that ring. I What I found with the UK during the early to mid-90s when I was first getting into the sport was that a lot of the names that were creeping up in, in sort of pay-per-views with the likes of Ben and Eubank and Bruno and, you know, Lewis, Langus Lewis, you know, these were the fighters that were starting to creep into the sort of the pay-per-view structure that was starting to come into fruition. And I think it's different when you've got fighters like that that are in highly competitive bouts that mean something. But when you've got fights where there's no meaning behind them and yet they label them as a pay-per-view, because maybe this guy has been in with a certain fighter or maybe he was a, a one belt champion at some point during his career. But yet the TV networks feel it's justified and not just the TV networks, but the promoters, of course, as well, in conjunction with feel it's warranted because this guy brings a name, he brings a following or whatever it is he brings to the table. They feel that's enough to be able to then label a fee with it. And a lot of the times, Luke, eh, you maybe get, a fight that will maybe appeal to you slightly. You might think, oh, you know, like Andy Ruiz versus Luis Ortiz is an appealing fight to a degree. But then the problem is also lies with how much money they absolutely spunk away on the main event and leave the undercard utter dross. It's just, you know, utter crap a lot of the time. Like a lot of Andy Joshua cards were like that in the UK. You know, he'd fight in arenas and stadiums in the UK on his... On his sort of tour and, and trajectory that he was on earlier on. And then the undercards would be shocking. They'd be absolutely garbage. Then they'd spend all the money on this main event and then leave absolutely nothing for the undercard. And then they'd still expect people to pay, like, the equivalent of about $40 
to watch just this one fighter and yet the promoters will happily come out and justify why they why they think this should happen anyway and it feels like more and more as the years have gone on like less less and less meaningful fights have become more pay-per-view marquee events and i don't understand how that can be justified by anybody involved in the sport but yeah it does i think beyond just that we have Regis Pro Gray Zapata. That's $59.99 in America. After that fight, we got Tyson Fury, Dillian White. Okay, that's ESPN Plus for America, but that's pay-per-view in the UK. Terrence Crawford versus David Avanesian. That's a pay-per-view fight. December 17th. Then January 7th, we got Tank versus Hector Luis Garcia. That's another pay-per-view when he comes back. So what is that? That's four to five and a half. Realistically, who can spend that? I'd rather spend that money on golf. I'd rather spend that on basically making fans make decisions. And that that's an issue. It's a lot of money to be shelling out in a short space of time. Like who in this current economic climate has that level of finance to be able to go and pay for these types of events? And I think I was talking to you on our big fight preview about this so for those that are listening that have already listened to that or maybe they haven't we was talking about the fact that like you guys in the u.s i've always felt you guys have been royally shafted like proper had your pants pulled down and and really shafted by the big tv networks from behind because you're talking about four or five pay-per-views there that you guys have got to pay for in comparison like we will only have to pay maybe one of them five pay-per-views that you're getting the rest of it will be covered within some type of of sky tv or virgin media subscription here in the uk so like okay we you know there is still a subscription that you've got to pay to sort of watch these fights through them sports providers but i still feel like we get it a little bit easier here than what you guys do and yet you're expected as fight fans to pay What's that? Anything up to $200 for so many pay-per-views over the course of a short space of time. And it happened quite recently. I think it was around September, October. There was about four or five pay-per-views within weeks of each other. And it was the same scenario yet again. Like, how can anybody thought of, like, the white-collar, the blue-collar working man, how can they afford that? How can they afford to pay that sort of money? Because... It isn't always just the money, though, isn't it? If you really want to delve deeper into it all, think about it. You you pay $60 or £25, £30 in the UK for a pay-per-view. The likelihood is, like, you're going to end up going and maybe having a beer, watching it, or you're going to end up buying some food and having something to eat. I mean, I don't know what everyone's customs are or traditions are, but, like, for me, you know, if I'm watching a big fight with, like, say, a couple of my friends... You know, I'd probably want to have a few drinks or something or, you know, go for a bite to eat first, then go for a few drinks. So by the end of it all, you've spent anything up to $150 or a £100 to £130 just on that one fight and that one fight card alone with the cost of, you know, being able to consume it. But even if you were just sat in your home consuming it through through your TV, you've still got that a fee attached to it. Then there's probably an extra bit of of money that you put into it by maybe having a drink at home or maybe, you know, catering to other people coming around to watch the fire review. So ultimately, each pay-per-view could cost you anything from like, what, $60 to $150 or £20 to about £60, £70 in the UK. So it's still a significant amount of money. And then imagine you're that much of a hardcore boxing fan that you would pay that every other week. Man, that's some huge outlays for what are mostly mediocre cards that are being put on and, and events that are not really worthy of it. Well, yeah. World Cup puts on the, the greatest sporting events head to head. The basketball, if you are in America, you like the NBA, it's got the greatest teams that go through a structured system. So the people go on and face each other. The NFL is the Super Bowl. In boxing, fighting the best and we're having to pay more for those this form of sporting so we're not getting the best matchups and we're having to matchups so inherently people who are going to think with their dollar or not have a deep connection to the sport you just gravitate to other sports that have better 
value laden propositions. Well, let me put it in a different way. I don't know how in America the World Cup is being consumed at the moment, but in the UK, it's on free to air television. Like the two big providers in the UK are, are ITV and the BBC for free to air television. And yet they have got the rights to show all the World Cup games between both channels. So if you're in the UK now, you're watching that football on either of those channels every single day during the course of the World Cup. How does it work in America? Do you have any sort of subscription there that you have to pay separately to watch like the World Cup football games? Because I know it's not like a major sport in America. It's like, say, in the top 10, but more towards the back end of a top 10 in terms of sports that are consumed there. I have no clue. I haven't watched and gone out of my way to watch it i've been a little busy but like i'd assume that if i wanted to go i television service platform would be i'd type in world cup and i'd simply be able to go okay it's going to record for whenever i want to see it or it'll give me the show listings i don't do all where it's like okay you need to upgrade to this package i'd assume that it would be readily available and that the barrier would just be the times that it's on for me it's it's like it annoys me Because of the fact that, you know, there's certain sports where you would, as a fan, you would be willing to shell that money out if there was justification behind it. Now, I know you mentioned earlier, you mentioned about the NFL, the NBA, and I imagine this happens in the NHL as well, with the best teams facing the best teams, getting to a stage where the best players will end up on the same court or pitch together. And, you know there can be justification behind you know a premium event taking place and it feels like boxing is the only sport where really that is absolutely not about providing the best level of quality in terms of what you're expected to see it is literally just more about trying to grab whatever name or fan base or demographic is associated with that one individual fighter and just sort of throwing them out there and going right we're going to stick you in here we've got you a fight lined up you know it's against a top 15 guy but we know you're going to sell tickets we know you're probably going to sell pay-per-views because of your name so we'll just stick you in this fight anyway like Crawford and Avenincians are probably an example Crawford brings a demographic I don't know what demographic and how much of a demographic but he brings an audience so to stick him in a fight with not Errol Spence is disappointing for everybody but yet there are Crawford fans that will still happily pay to see Crawford in there with what will be put out there as the toughest test of his career arguably could be but ultimately when you're within this sport you don't want to consume the fights that just don't makes sense when you want to see the best fight the best and there's always talks and there's no reasons why they can't fight each other you know we're not getting the fights that are necessary to propel the sport to the levels it could be back to once again and i feel like we are on a little bit of a a decline and i feel it is basically the people at the top of the food chain the tv network promoters the, uh, the the boxing promoters, the managers, anybody that that's sort of involved at that top level, it's a combination of, of quite a few different individuals and companies that are bringing it completely down and and just it's still like they sat at the top of the mountain and saying you know we're just going to charge this amount of money, these guys right at the bottom of the mountain are the consumer, and you will pay this money to watch this fight or you don't watch this fight, and then you get the people like the average boxing fan that'll sit there and go do you know what i don't want to miss this fight it's my favorite fighter or it's um you know there's there's a fighter on the card i want to see and, and they'll go out and they'll pay it and it also makes me wonder well it doesn't make me wonder it it, it doesn't surprise me why people then turn to streaming and or, or watching it online the next day when somebody uploads it from somewhere you know albeit that is going down an illegal route to do that but it really doesn't surprise me why people do it. People don't People don't want to pay that money for a fight. They'd rather go and look at an alternative way of watching the fight. And then ultimately what that does is then it just hurts the fighters when it comes down to it. Because if they don't sell as many pay-per-view buys or tickets or whatever it is they get a share of within the contracts of that particular fight, it hurts them more than anybody. 
but it doesn't hurt the promoter because they probably already got their slice of the pie weaved into that particular contract. I'm going on a bit of a ramble about it here, so feel free now to sort of interject and jump in and just throw your thoughts in. Yeah, I mean, I think the big issue is that we just don't get the fights we want to see. And it's been going on for so long that we've had fighters who are young fighters who never fought the old fighters and they never really seemingly fought the guys we wanted to see them fight until all the other options have been expended until people lose a fight, right? Until people don't have leverage because boxing isn't a business at all. People always go, oh, no, it isn't. If boxing was a business, the customer is always right. That's business 101. You give the customer the best thing possible. Boxing consistently does not give the customer the best thing ever. That is not a business. Boxing is politics. It's power brokering. It's leveraging I'm more powerful. It's Republicans. It's Democrats. It's Boris Johnson. It's if I'm in power, you have to listen to me. I hold all the tools. And the issue with the sport is it's a lot of people playing power broker like this is politics and making people have to belittle themselves or humble themselves to get opportunities. And that's what's hurt the sport, I think. What can we do? Like, we can't do anything, can we? Like, me and you physically couldn't do anything to change that. But what I'm talking about is, like, generally what would have to happen for change to be made to to make it more significant? Does it need some sort of... I think for us, it's about voicing honest... I think that these honest opinions are how represented because people don't feel like their their honest feelings are being brought up in platforms that they like. I think another thing is do what people always do. Vote with your dollar. Pick and choose what you wish to consume. If the promoters aren't giving you good fights, you don't have to consume it. I know it sucks as a fight fan, but if you don't like the fights right now, if you're not getting the fights, don't feel burdened to just go because that should be a wake-up call to everyone if you're not giving the good fights then you're probably not getting the good revenue so do you think it's about maybe starving the pipeline a little bit even though it does affect ultimately the guys that are getting in the ring because they're not going to eventually get the money maybe that they're they're contracted to get or they're they're hoping to get is is it is it about you know like you say start you know picking and choosing what you want to watch and what you don't or what you won't pay for or is it about maybe trying to you know bring some sort of revolution forward by starving the pipeline by not buying the pay-per-views and showing that you know when these pay-per-view buys significantly drop as a result of that 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 is essentially the only way to stick it to the man because I suppose, what other way could you stick it to the man? There isn't any other way you could because at the end of the day, no matter what happens, you know, there's people out there that will blindly and loyally still go and buy them and buy the pay-per-views regardless of, of what people like me and you sit here and say. They'll go, well, do you know what? I don't really care. I wanna, I'm want i going to watch this. I'm going to pay for it anyway. So uh, there's still people out there that will foolishly go down that route and do it. But, you know, I think there is a lot of people within the sport itself that are starting to sort of feel a very similar way and it's about trying to I suppose shooting the breeze is about just having an honest conversation about things isn't it it's about just sort of saying things as you as you interpret them and and for me I think the pay-per-view aspect of boxing is is killing the sport it really is killing the sport and it's going to continue to prevent fighters from getting the opportunities essentially that they 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 need and deserve there are some fighters that might not get the opportunity because there's been preferences to certain fighters getting on certain pay-per-view networks or you know whether it be you know like the fight tv app we were talking about in in the preview show and, and, and other sort of smaller streaming services like that that are now coming into the market so I think it's it is it, killing the sport. It's killing the opportunities for people. And if you get a pay per view and it's poor and the whole card is poor, the likelihood is nobody's going to tune into that again. Nobody's going to go and buy that pay per view again. So then ultimately, the people that are on that card that are expecting to get paid and having the opportunity to be on a platform, 
nobody's going to tune in and watch them. So really, they're not on a platform as such. It's only like the guys in the arena or the the sort of the small leisure centres or you know gym gymnasiums or wherever they hold the fights. They're going to end up losing out even more. So for me, all around as a whole, I think pay per view is just killing boxing. I mean, boxing's all like when boxing was on America when PBC did the free boxing for all, which kind of has aged bad with kind of the advent of pay-per-view lately it's like it went free boxing for all and then seven years later it's pay-per-view fights mostly um the issue i see is the fights we consistently want to see just don't get made and then we're told by promoters enough to understand why these fights we want to see shouldn't be made because we just don't get it we don't get that they're going to make a ton of money and we should be pumped that they're making a ton of money. I've never heard of another sport where Ronaldo is not going to go for a championship because he needs to kind of get back into the gears of things, but he's making a ton of money and think about all the cool stuff Ronaldo could do, you know, awesome. And you can get ownership of his success by just aligning with him and being proud of him making money. It's very much the same trick people did in politics, right? People vote against their own best interests. This is the same tactic. This is why it's politics. We're finding ways where the the general public's best interest is not buying pay-per-views. Yet you have people out there that want to buy pay-per-views as opposed to find creative new methods. Why isn't YouTube TV a platform people are using to broadcast pay-per-views if these YouTube... So I'm going to move the conversation in a slightly different direction from pay-per-views killing boxing and actually talk about a fight <laughs> we shooting the breeze on a fight tank versus garcia it's been talked about on social media quite heavily recently about them fighting and it's been signed and you know there's this back and forth between each team on social media my understanding of the whole situation is that they're signing to fight early next year uh, it's they're gonna it's gonna happen and you know, we've, we've been talking about Tank and Garcia uh, between us and on different shows in the past for probably the best part of 12 months now. And we've always said about Garcia, he needs a big fight. He needs a huge defining fight. If this fight actually happens and they do get in the ring against one another, like initially, what are your thoughts on it and how it plays out? A really good fight. And I think it's a lot closer than people think. But I think the bigger thing is, Beyond that, I think that the visual, the crowd, and the level of excitement is where fights like Hagler Hearns used to be. And I think that that's a fight that could bring a lot of new faces into box. I believe Errol Spence versus Terrence Crawford is that level of fight. Tank versus Garcia is a much bigger fight. I think Errol Spence versus Terrence Crawford is more like a Sergey Kevlov versus Andre Ward or an Adonis Stevenson versus Sergey Kovalev or Chad Dawson versus Andre Ward. It's a great fight, or Floyd Mayweather versus Zab Judah. It was a fight to create a star. It isn't a blockbuster fight. And I think that Garcia versus Tank is just that. It's a great fight. I'm excited for it. Like when I seen the, the, the conversations happening, I was like, this is this is what boxing needs at the moment. Like we're talking about how certain things are killing the sport. You know, it's, it's stuff like this that come around and you think to yourself, this is fantastic. Like this is exactly why like people will automatically then be sucked back into it because of the fact that you'll get two guys uh, you know, at the at the sort of peak of where they're at at the moment, who need big fights, need huge fights, and they need to basically show the world they are the best at what they do. And this is the only way uh, you're going to be able to do it is by these guys going in against each other. And this is this is great when the stuff like this happens because for me, it it makes you come back into the sport when you sort of start to fall out of love with it a little bit. This then goes ahead and sucks you right back into where you want to be within the sport. So we're going from one opposite conversation to another. You know, we're going from a, a huge negative on pay-per-views to a positive about certain fights being made. And, and brilliant, absolutely brilliant that this fight is is pretty much, you know, signed, sealed and delivered until we get a, an official date and I actually see them in the ring together. There's still time for it to completely fall through. So we'll, uh, we'll certainly see what happens when this comes around uh changing conversation you know i wanted to talk about a, a recent drugs 
test that was failed by a certain Zalani Tete. That's been reported today as we record this that he was tested positive for a banned substance in a UCAD test around the time of his knockout of Jason Cunningham back in July. Apparently at the moment the situation is under investigation. Tete's manager has said that we are confident that this is one big mistake. Where have we heard this one before? I mean, there's so many tropes in boxing. Like, we've never heard an amateur boxer say, man, I'm really suited for the amateurs. I'm not actually really have a pro style. So it's going to take me about eight years instead of two to transfer to a pro. And I've never heard of a a guy who gets, you got me. You know, the competition's really tough. I'm getting older. I don't know if I can do it. So I did drugs. Have we ever heard that guy? Like, not really in boxing. So it's very unfathomable to believe that this is an accident. This conversation always happens, though. Like, it seems to be becoming more and more prevalent about the fact that, you know, you've got guys that are seemingly at a a, a certain point of the career. And, you know, like Conor Ben, for example, that, that conversation's been had so many times in the past couple of months. But I was surprised when I seen Tete's name come up, to be honest, because I thought why why would he want to go and do this at this stage of his career why would he want to you know take a performance enhancing drug is he is he not satisfied with his career is he you know because to me i was always seeing him coming towards the end of his career going into the cunningham fight and i just thought to myself you know we're not maybe going to see the same zalani tete but then when he obviously knocked him out we automatically assumed that it was just the power being the last thing to go on a fight up was the reason why cunningham was stopped in the fight but then when you read reports like this it, it really does make you question again like why was he able to do that? Was it now because of the fact that he took a test and he's been tested positive for a banned substance and it was around the time that he had this fight automatically? You just kind of put two and two together and just go, yeah, that that's that's how it seems. But then you get the, the pivot sort of conversations going on with the promoters who will pivot away from it. You'll get the managers who will pivot away from it and try to say that there was some sort of excuse as to why this has happened. I just don't understand it. I mean, you go to a lot of gyms, you spend a lot of time with a lot of fighters, you know, younger or at different stages of their careers. I've done the same thing and I've never really sort of got the impression that a lot of these guys were wanting to do something to to sort of enhance their career in that way. A lot of them just want to achieve something in the sport. Some of them you know, are more ambitious than others. Some of them, it's quite obvious that they might never get to a certain level, but I can't honestly say I've been around any fighter where I thought, you know, I've got a feeling this guy might, you know, be one of them guys that could end up going down that route. I mean, have you ever been around anyone at all without naming any names that you kind of got this impression that maybe they could be the sort of character that could delve into that shady world? I mean, I don't know if I have, but by default, like... You got to remember, like I've worked with Victor Conti and I consider Victor Conti a good friend. And anyone that ever looks at me will always label me based off of Victor's past. I know he's not doing it right now, but you got to understand when you start using would and could. I mean, I directly know someone that the federal government labeled with this burden and viewed him like Saddam Hussein. When, in my opinion, every single other person was doing it, he was just the most successful when he got caught. So I think that. What that says to me is enhancing drugs. I really don't think it's a morality component for most people. I think it's a survival component. You look at older fighters that are having trouble keeping up with other guys. I think there's always the suspicion when guys have a second act to their career. He points out like a guy like Roger Clemens, he was on the way down and then he miraculously came back up in baseball. So when you look at guys who were kind of going down, and then kind of have this weird career trajectory later in their career, you kind of wonder what did they figure out later in their career. But that makes me wonder why Conor Ben will have have done something of that nature. Or will it have been the point where he was really struggling against Cedric Paynard and he arguably should have lost against Cedric Paynard earlier in his career. And then I think from then onwards, he just started to seemingly get better and better and better. And then he started putting guys away that not, normally you would see get put away especially when he puts Vargas and Algeri and then Van Heerden away the way he put them away was quite spectacular and at the time we was just like 
for me personally, I was like, wow, he has really, really improved. And now this has all come out about him. It, it makes me question, you know, the legitimacy of, of those victories now, like how he's seemingly, you know, been able to, to get, put this guy away. Why is Mauricio Lara currently not ranked in a sanctioning body that forces drug testing? And does that make people question the fact that Josh Warrington, when he got knocked out, and some of the ways that uh, Mauricio Lara is able to fight, I'm not saying he's abusing drugs, but why is, can can him or his team answer why they're not ranked in a division that requires drug testing? I think that is a fair, honest question to ask. It's a very fair, honest question, and people can make their own assumptions about whether or not he's not in a, a, a ranking because of the fact that maybe there is something going on. It, 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 you do kind of automatically jump to conclusions with it. Naturally, I think most humans would say, hang on a minute, well, if he's not ranked and he's not intended to get himself ranked and, and put into these, you know, these, these testing cycles, why is that? Why is he able to hurt people the way he's hurt them? Why was he able to seemingly beat the hell out of Josh Warrington when Josh Warrington was in those types of dogfights previous to that with many different fighters on different levels and yet was able to get through them fights seemingly unscathed, but yet he gets in with Lara and gets blown away. It really does make you ask them questions and want to know the answers to them. When you put it like that about Lara, it, it, for me, it does kind of open the door to suspicion of, of maybe what is going on. Is there is there a reason why? Is there a legitimate reason why he's not ranked... Let's go deeper. How many good comeback stories in boxing are also people abusing PEDs? Well, not boxing. I just thought of Lance Armstrong off the top of my head. The cyclist who was proven. That That's the first person I thought of. Like, as soon as you said that comeback story, Lance Armstrong was the first name that popped in my head. But boxing-wise, I mean... Who who has done it? Who has come back? I mean, I'm not going to say any names, but I mean, it's like when you look at guys or gals in sports and they're making a comeback when you thought they'd fallen off, that can be a red flag to look at. It's either they're the outlier and they're able to work harder than other people or there might be something weird going on. I mean, what about like sports like golf, like Tiger Woods, like seemingly going downhill? Is is there an argument there for something like that? Or I mean, am I just stretching? His, body, his body's breaking down, I think, is one of the issues. But like with golf, here's another thing. Most of the golfers, there's a slew of golfers that look like bodybuilders. Is there any form of a drug test with these guys that are hitting the golf ball 370 yards? I'm not aware fully. There's probably some forms of tests. But doesn't the tour kind of want guys to hit it super far? Because most people can't envision how hard a 25-foot putt under pressure is. But they think, oh, my God, this guy hits it 370. I'll go tell my friends. Like that's kind of how they make their money is – the fantastical shots that they provide. So I think that's kind of the ugly thing. Like tennis, like really built to play that sport long term, like not really. So how do people consistently keep at that level? It's a very interesting topic, very interesting questions. And I'm sure everybody listening has got some very interesting answers and takes on it. And I, I think it's probably a good point to leave it very open-ended for people now on this episode like we're not going to go into any more conspiracies at this moment in time because i want to leave it quite open-ended for people luca i want people to listen to this section of the episode and go do you know what these guys have made some really valid points and i want you guys listening to interact and tell us like tweet at btr boxing pod on twitter facebook instagram youtube or even on the tiktok audiogram just let us know what you think your conversations are and your opinions are around this. Mauricio Lara, for example, not to put him as a scapegoat, but it's a very good question that Lukey poses. And I think maybe I'd like to hear some of the answers that people have got because it does make for an interesting topic of debate. So with that in mind, Lukey, thank you for coming on and shooting the breeze with me for another episode about the boxing pay-per-views and drugs cheats and drug testing within boxing. We've had a great conversation. Because like guys could die and boxing basically has one of the most archaic testing systems and this is exactly why it needs to be overhauled and until that point 
we are probably going to find that there's going to be more and more of these guys that come out of the woodwork at some point or another. So Lani Tete now appears to be the recent one. So we'll see what happens with that. We'll see what happens with Connor Ben. But I implore everybody listening to go and let us know what you think and give us that dialogue, give us that conversation. You know where to find myself. You know where to find Lukey at ITR Boxing and on Twitter at Lukey Boxing. It's been a great little episode. Again, shooting the breeze with you, Lukey. Thanks to everybody for listening as always we appreciate your support you know where to find us where to subscribe do all the necessaries thanks for listening and we will be back with another shooting the breeze episode next week Ah!